topic for today, parenting, raising the next generation. Quick summary of where we are at. The last two sermons were on parenting already. First one, we looked at the topic of our childhood. How our childhood, how the way our parents parented us, how that affects us and how we can get rid of the generational curse, passing on the wounds that we have received to our own children. Last time we looked at disciplining our children. What does the Bible actually say about discipline and how to discipline our children and how not to? Now today we'll conclude this sub-series on parenting by looking at the topic, raising the next generation. Details of what I mean by that I'll explain in a minute. And then next time in two weeks, we will conclude this whole family and relationship series by looking one more time at the importance of relationships, the importance of family, the importance of friendship, and the importance of unity within the body of Christ. Kind of putting it all together, what we've talked about over these last three, four months, and really then focusing again on how important it all is that we have been studying over these weeks. As for today, there are obviously two aspects. One is about being parents, because if we are parents, then obviously we want to raise the next generation in a godly way. But it also, if you're not yet a parent, there's another aspect to it. And that is, of course, what about being parented? Because the things that we study today, all of us have either experienced them in our childhood, or we have not experienced them in our childhood. And that affects us today. And so even if you're not a parent today, I want you to also think about how was this in my childhood? Did it go well? Did it not go well? And if it, especially if it didn't, then to really ask the question, how does that affect me today? And what can I ask Jesus to heal me of the things that I'm still carrying around? All right, so let's dive into it. Our ultimate goal in parenting is obviously, once again, bringing glory to God raising the next generation to bring glory to God as well. One more? There we go. Malachi 2.15, we already looked at that one a few weeks ago. And did not he, God, make them one, talking about two people who are married to each other? It had the remnant of the Spirit. Yet had he the remnant of the Spirit. And why one? That he might seek a godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none go treacherously against the wife of his youth. Offspring is used in this translation. Some translations use the word seed, which actually I like in this verse more, because it's a little bit more descriptive of what is actually, what is, what is actually being said here. What does seed to do? Seed reproduces itself. It creates more of its own kind. That's what seed does. So what are we supposed to do as Christians with our children? We are to reproduce, not that our children become exactly like us, but what is most important? As we bring glory to God in this generation, so the next generation, our children, are also to bring glory to God. That's our goal. Psalm 145, we looked at that verse at the beginning. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Again, the same message as in Malachi, God expects us to pass on our faith to the next generation, especially to our children. The best time to reach a child is obviously when they are young. I personally became a Christian when I was 25. I had to deal with a lot of baggage. For 25 years, I was in the world. I did the things of the world. I believed the things of the world. And obviously, during all that time, there was a lot of stuff in my life that I had to get rid of and that I still have to get rid of today. So it's more difficult for me becoming a Christian as an adult. But when children grow up in a Christian home, they have opportunities that I never had. They have opportunities from the very beginning to distinguish between the lies of the world and the truth from the Bible. 
and to never allow those lies to become part of their lives. As parents, we need to be aware. If we don't do our job as parents when children are young, it's going to get a lot harder for them to become Christians 20, 30, 40 years later. We have the best opportunity to ever reach them throughout their whole lives. Let's make use of that. Now the reality, of course, is the devil knows this truth much better than we do. And that's why the devil will do everything he can to tempt our children, especially our children, to turn away from God again. And his main tool that he's using, the world, people around us, peer pressure, everything that is going on in schools and everything, people around our children, lies from society, that everybody says this is proven, like evolution and all these things, which is not proven at all. It's as much a leap of faith to believe in evolution as it is to believe in Jesus. It's always a step of faith. It cannot be proven. But these kind of lies have crept into society, and our kids are bombarded with them. Using non-Christians to get to our children, speaking to them, friendships with non-Christians and all these things, to speak lies into their lives. Look at what's happening nowadays from a very young age. Up. Drugs that are being distributed, or at least talked about in school, and then children coming together and getting drugs from somewhere. Teaching on evolution, sex education. Isn't it terrible what is now being taught in school nowadays at such an early age, which has nothing to do with the Bible? Tolerance towards one another. Yes, we are to be tolerant, but this kind of nonsense like all religions are true, all religions are the same, it cannot be true. With an objective eye, you cannot say that all religions can be true or that all religions are the same. Teachings like there is no absolute truth, which is absolute nonsense. The statement there is no absolute truth is a contradiction in itself because it's making a claim that is absolute. All this stuff is being bombarded to our children every single day. And it all comes from the devil. Because he knows exactly. He wants to get to our children because he knows if our children grow up in a godly way, they have opportunities to really change the world. And the devil is fighting against that with all his power. Our children are at the front line of the spiritual warfare. As a result, many parents then ask the question, how can I help my child go the right path? With all this weird stuff that my child is being bombarded every single day, and in a country like Germany, homeschooling is illegal, so I am not even allowed to pull my children out of that and educate them at home. How on earth can I help my kids go the right way? And what can I do so that they turn out well and they don't turn out as like the world 20 years from now? We all know we cannot overprotect them because if we overprotect them, then they will just be exposed to the same things 20 years later. We can't just forbid, we can't just say, no, you mustn't do that because that's helping for a time, but definitely not long term. We can't simply let them try and say, yeah, just go ahead, just give it a try, and just have sex, just have drugs, you'll find out that it's bad. We can't do that either. So what can we do? Obviously, it's, there's not a simple answer, but there are a few principles that the Bible gives us, things that we can apply in our daily lives. And I want to take us through some of them today. Here's the first one. Pray, pray, pray. Pray and pray. It's a spiritual battle. And a spiritual battle cannot be won with words. It cannot be won with actions or anything. A spiritual battle can only be won if we pray. Because only Jesus can win that battle. First area, we need to acknowledge that we are completely dependent on God in this. John 5, 19, Jesus saying, Then answer Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son, referring to himself, can do nothing of himself, 
but what he sees the Father do. For whatsoever things he does, he is all who does the Son likewise. If Jesus acknowledges, I can do nothing by myself, who are we then to think that we can raise our children in a way that they turn out in a godly way? We need to acknowledge that we are completely dependent on God when it comes to raising our kids. And we do that when we pray. That's the first area we need to pray for ourselves so that we are completely dependent on God. Secondly, of course, we also need to pray for our children. Once I acknowledge I can't do anything by myself, I cannot raise my kids, then my attitude will change. And then I will say, God, you have to save them. I cannot save them. You have to save them. And we start praying for their salvation. We will acknowledge, I can't protect them. So we ask God, God, you protect them because I can't. I can teach them, but I cannot give them wisdom. So God, you give them wisdom. God, I'm in no control of circumstances. So God, you need to give them favor. God, I cannot convict them of sin, because they can always say, well, that's just your opinion. You have to give them a hatred of sin. Now, of course, the details of that would be a whole sermon in itself, but my point being, we need to start with praying for ourselves and for our children. If we don't pray, parenting is going to be a lot harder than it ought to be. Next principle, build strong relationships. Fact from society, if you make a statistic about people who are in legal trouble, people who are in prison, people who are in any kind of legal trouble, and you ask the question, what do they have in common? Why do they, how, yeah, what do they have in common? And what is something that very often leads to people getting in legal trouble eventually? One of the major factors is they are from a broken family background. People who are from a healthy family hardly ever get in legal trouble. And most of the time, if it's a really broken family background, they grow up with one parent or with no parents at all, or if the parents are abusive and these kind of things, that's when children turn the other way. We have around 20 years that we spend with our children in the same home. Children live the remaining 60 years or whatever time they have on the foundation that we built while they were still with us. The childhood determines everything else for the rest of their life. A stable family, loving relationships, healthy relationships with one another usually lead to a stable life, to a healthy life. A messy family, a broken family, an abusive family, all these things usually eventually leads to the same thing in the next generation. Build strong relationship. Now to make sure our children have a stable home, we need to take care of our marriage first. Sounds contradictive, but it's actually true. Children feel more safe if they realize mom and dad have a good relationship with each other. The relationship with me is not that great, but I see they have a good relationship with each other. That gives children more security than if the marriage is broken, but both parents have a good relationship with the child. Children get their stability, they get their security from the security and stability of their parents' marriage. That's why we may never get this priority wrong. Marriage comes before our children. As a fascinating experiment people once did, they analyzed small kids, um, tod toddlers and even before toddlers, babies, and they just gave them, put them in different environments and they studied when do kids sleep well and when do kids not sleep well. Do you know what was one of the best ways to put them to sleep? The parents talking peacefully with each other. 
It's born in them. They don't understand anything. I mean, if a child is six months old, you, they can't study yet. Okay, parents and relationship and everything. They don't have any of that. But what God puts into them is they feel safe and they feel secure when mommy and daddy have a good relationship. And they see that when they talk with each other peacefully and when they experience that peace in their parents' relationship, they go to sleep peacefully and feel safe. That's how God created us. It says something. Children feel safe when the marriage relationship of their parents is stable and healthy. Let's get our priorities right. Yes, children need a lot of our time. They need a lot of our energy. Sometimes they really, and we have nothing, it feels like we have nothing left in the evening after taking care of a crying baby for 12 hours, those kind of things. But let's make sure that we don't get our priorities wrong. Marriage is always more important than the children. And that blesses them, even though it sounds contradictory. Here's the key. Children don't have the need for strong relationships and security met at home. They'll look for it somewhere else. When kids feel safe at home, they feel loved, they feel accepted, then they will go out into this world, they will go into school and hear of drugs and hear of sex and hear of all these things. And what will they think? They will think, I don't need that. I have a loving family. I'm loved by my parents. I feel safe there. I feel comfortable there. I don't need drugs. I don't need all this stuff on there. But if they don't have this kind of need met at home, what will they do? They hear about how other kids are happy or pretend to be happy. They hear that other people are excited about drugs, that other people are excited about sex and all these things. And then they will say, Hmm, I have a hole in my heart. There is a need of love, of acceptance, of security that is not met at my home. Maybe I'll find it there. And then they go to all the wrong places. Parents, does it help to tell our children, you've got to fight the temptation? Just don't do drugs. Just don't go sex. It's not good. Does that help? It doesn't help. It's just a rule. And the children will disobey it as soon as they can. Instead, our approach has to be, let's give our children something better. Let's give them a healthy and stable home so that all those temptations are not tempting to them at all because they know, I have something better at home. I trust my parents, and so I'm going to follow them. Along the same lines, speak forth through identity. Every child asks the question, who am I? Why am I here? Am I loved? Every single person in this world asks these kind of identity questions. Now for us as Christians, we have the answer. And we can experience that in our relationship with Christ. But as parents, we have this, an additional responsibility. We need to speak this identity into our children. We have to tell our children, you're loved, you're special, you're so gifted. We're so glad that you're with us. We're so glad that you're part of this family. You're God's child. God loves you much more than I could ever love you. He wanted you, he brought you to us. God has a plan for your life. You're not an accident. God wanted you. That's why he created you. He created you for his glory. That's your purpose. We need to communicate that to our children. Of course, not just saying these things for the sake of saying them, but really saying them and meaning them and speaking for us true identity into our children's lives. If they go to school and they feel like the odd one, they feel like, all my friends, they are just so happy with drugs. They're so happy with doing all this weird stuff. And all I have is my weird parents who tell me I'm not allowed to do this. 
if that's how they grow up, eventually they will break loose of these chains and just do exactly the opposite of what we want them to do. What we have to do instead is we have to give them something better so that they say, I don't need all this stuff out there. That's our job as parents. Next principle, teach. We gotta teach our children. Deuteronomy 11, therefore shall we lay up these words in your heart and in your soul. Bind them for a sign upon your hand that they might be as frontlets between your eyes. But, no. And you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if you shall diligently keep all these commands which I command you, to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all these ways, and to cleave unto them, then will the Lord drive on all these nations from before you, and you shall possess nations greater and mightier than yourselves. And two things that God is saying here. One is, you got to be diligent in seeking God, studying his word, seeking his will, all these things. But then there's also this part. Teach them to your children. We are responsible to pass on to the next generation what God has been speaking to us. Sunday school can help. Christian relatives can help, books can help. There's nothing wrong with these things. But in the end, the foundation needs to be laid by the parents. Teach your children. What is right? What is wrong? What is okay? What is not okay? What does God say in certain situations? What does the Bible say? All these things. If we don't teach our children, they will not know how to deal with the situations when they face them. What do you think? If two Christian kids go to school and they're both in the same situation, being offered drugs or whatever, one of them has been taught by the parents, the other one has not been taught what the Bible says about these topics. Which one do you think will make the right choice? Which one will make the wrong choice? Well, the Bible tells us. Proverbs 7, Behold, among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went away to her house, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she outside, now in the streets, and lies in wait at every corner. So she caught him, kissed him, and with impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore, come I forth to meet you diligently to seek your face, and I have found you. Next slide, please. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with colored spreads, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with mirrors, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With the fluttering of her lips, she seduced him. He goes after her immediately as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till an arrow strikes through his labor, as a bird hastens to the snare, and he knows not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways, go not astray in her paths, for she has cast down many wounded here, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way, is the way of show, going down to the chambers of death. Nice little story, sad little story. A young man really throwing his whole life away for harlotry, being totally yeah, deceived 
by a woman, and he could not resist her. Now, what was this guy's problem? Why did he fall for her? Well, at the very beginning, there was a description of him. He was among the simple ones, and he was void of understanding. That's the description of this young man. How would we describe that? In other words, he was never taught. Nobody ever told him. Nobody prepared him for this situation. Nobody told him there is stuff out there. Nobody told him there are harlots who are after you. There are people who try to get you. And when he faced her, he was like, what should I do? He had nothing within him to resist her. And since he had nothing to resist her, he gave in and he threw his life away. The problem was nobody told him. Nobody taught him. Parents, that's our job. When our kids meet this hollow, when our kids meet the drug dealer, when our kids go out there and listen to uh, see everybody being drunk, having wild sex and all these things, it's our job that they are prepared for that. And when they face it, when they see it, they know how to deal with it. Because we have already equipped them. My point being, be proactive. Don't wait until your children, until the world told your children everything about sex, which is all wrong. Be proactive. Don't wait until your child has been offered drugs, but then it might be too late. Don't wait until your child is already good friends with all the wrong people, and they are close to each other, and you're like, what do I do now? How do I end these friendships? They are not healthy for my children. Be proactive. Be there for them before they face these kind of situations. Tell your children the biblical truth about sex before the world gets a chance. Tell, them, tell your children about the dangers of drugs before they are being offered. Tell your children about the importance of choosing the right friends before they end up with the, with the wrong people. Obviously, you can't do that. You have to be wise. We can't tell a two-year-old everything about sex. That does not make sense. He, will not, he or she will not understand. And my point being, our problem is too often we wait too long. And then the problem is already there, and then we try to correct the damage that has already been done. We've got to act earlier. We've got to be proactive. So that when our children face these things, like this guy in the book of Proverbs faces the harlot, they know children know what to do because we have already equipped them. Be proactive. Don't avoid the issue. Don't think, oh, they'll figure it out. Be there for them before they face it. Here's something important to know about the difference of fathers and mothers. Might not apply to 100%, but very often. Most mothers instinctively protect their children from danger. That's how God wired women. Most fathers instinctively prepare their children for danger. Both is, of course, important. If we never protect our children from danger, they are going to get killed. If we don't prepare them for danger, they're going to mess up their lives when they're older. Both is necessary. I'm not saying that men or women are better or more important in this, but what I'm saying is we got to be aware that our spouse probably has a different approach to these kind of dangerous situations. But it's not either or. It's not like, okay, I know better than my wife or my wife knows better than me. We've got to learn to use both approaches and make the most of the situation. Sometimes it is necessary for a child to be protected from danger. And sometimes it is necessary for a child to be prepared for danger. So the reason why I'm putting this in here, fathers, 
we have a special responsibility here. When it comes to preparing our children for the world, when it comes to preparing our kids for the day when they will face drugs, when they will face immor sexual immorality and all these things, we fathers have a more important role in this aspect than, our, than the mothers, because it's our job to prepare our children for danger that they will face in this world. Next principle, communicate. Have the habit of sharing life, sharing your days with each other, hopefully each day. Ask each other questions. How was your day? What went well in school? Any concerns you have in school right now? Any questions you have about things you experienced in school today? Anything that you didn't understand? Anything that you faced, you didn't know how to deal with it? If we don't ask these kind of questions, and we kind of just leave our children alone, how can we help them? They will probably, some kids share by themselves. Most kids don't really share as much as we want them to share. So we gotta ask questions. We gotta be there for them. Of course, we have to be careful to not interrogate our kids, but we can do it in a way that is very healthy. What we try in our family is, we make it a point, we have breakfast together, and we have dinner together. And over those meals, we talk and we ask each other. We're not just asking the kids, because then they will feel like they're being put on the spot. We ask each other, how was your day? How do you feel today? Was there something bad that happened today? All these things. And if the parents get in the habit of sharing, the parents get in the habit of talking, confessing and saying, you know how it worked today, I really messed up and I feel really bad. That gives permission to the kids to do the same and to say, I had a test today or a teacher asked me something and I felt really bad because I didn't know the answer and I felt horrible. Parents, we set the example, but we need to take the time. It's so easy to be busy, isn't it? And to feel like, okay, there's so much to go on and okay, let's not deal with the kid's mess at the end of the day because I'm already exhausted. It's so easy to fall in that trap. What we need to do is make that a priority. And like I said, for that, for us, that means we make it a real effort to have two meals each day together. Might not work exactly the same for you, but make it a point. Don't just make family time when you have the time. Really put that in your schedule and arrange other things away so that you have that time for each other. And you know what happens if we do that? 20 years with our kids? It will be a habit for them as well. And it's very likely that they're going to do the same with their family as well. And maybe they do it with us still when they're 30, when they're 40, maybe not every day. But that is a good sign that maybe they will call us. They will still ask for our opinion when they are 40 in these kind of things. Because we have built that foundation for 20 years as we live together. Next principle, love. Already mentioned how important it is for children to be loved. If they don't feel loved at home, they will look for love somewhere else. And if they can't find it, then they will go in all the wrong places. Now here's something again specifically for the fathers. Of course it applies to mothers as well, but this verse really speaks to fathers. And you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What happens to children if they feel like, okay, my daddy is telling me all these hundred things that I have to do and that I cannot do? What's going on in their mind, in their heart? They'll be really angry. That was my childhood. I had all these rules from my parents. I didn't experience much love, but I had a lot of rules from my parents and I didn't understand why these rules, why I should follow these rules. And eventually, as I became a teenager, that anger and that frustration that built over years and years and years just came out 
and my relationship with my parents got really, really bitter for a while. It works with small kids to make them you have to follow because I'm your parent and I'll force you to follow. With small kids that works, but soon, as they're 10, 15 or so, they will not work any longer. They will find their ways to sneak out and they will find their ways to get what we are forbidding them. Children do not follow if they have to follow. We don't want to force our children. What we want is, we want our children to choose to follow. Now, how do we get our children to choose to follow us? It's only one way. Love. Our children have to feel loved by us. If they don't feel loved by us, they are gone as soon as they have the opportunity. Yes, it is our job to discipline. It is our job to correct. It is our job to make them feel uncomfortable sometimes and to allow them to say, because you've done something bad, here are bad consequences that you're going to hate. That is part of what we need to do as parents. But in all of that, make sure that your kids feel loved and that they always know that we discipline them because we love them, that we say no to them because we love them. Now this is of course a very challenging job because each child is different. For some kids, if I think of my children, Abby feels loved when she's just in my arms. That's her, she's just cuddly. And so that's how she feels loved and that's how I balance out being, being very strict with her at times. But as I know as long as she has that time as well, she knows that she's still loved. And that's how I make sure that she doesn't feel, like it says in this verse, that she doesn't feel wrath towards me. Anna is the reasonable one. With her, I need to talk a lot. That way she feels loved. Noah, I need to have fun with him. That's how he feels loved, playing football together, playing sports together, these kinds of things. So it's very, very different and very, very personal. But make sure that in all the disciplining and all the correction, all the saying, no, this is not good for you and all these things. Our children don't get, get up wrath over years and years, but all the time they know I'm loved and my parents want the best for me. Next principle, be an example. Children will follow their parents' actions way more than they follow their parents' words. What do you think happens if we tell our children, kids, don't smoke, it's not good for you, but the parents smoke? Will that be convincing? Will it be convincing to tell our kids, kids, God hates lies, so always tell the truth. And then they catch us in white lies all the time. What do you think they will think? We say, don't be greedy. Money is not that important. But at every opportunity, they see us grabbing, running after money. We tell our kids, read your Bible every day. It will really help you. And they never see us reading our Bible. Will any of that be convincing? Of course not. You know what the highest standard is that our children will follow? Our lifestyle. You cannot expect your kids to go any higher than what we practice. So be an example. Live out what you teach your children. Because if our words contradict our actions, they will follow our actions and not our words. Be an example to your children. Another principle, and I already mentioned this a little bit in the last sermon, teach your children to make good choices. Forcing children works for a time as long as they are young, but it will not work for long. And if they feel forced, they will soon turn the other way. For this reason, I try not to force my kids. Sometimes it's necessary, but as much as I can, I try not to tell my kids, you have to do this, you have to do that, and then kind of forcing them with my so far still superior strength, kind of 
forcing them to do something. Yeah, now and then it's necessary, but as much as I can, I try to avoid that. Instead, I try, try to take a different approach. I tell them, you know, you're at a crossroad here. You can take this path or you can take that path. You know, I see an advantage in this path, and this is why. But there are also a few challenges if you take this path. Now, if you take that path, this might be easier, this might be a little bit more difficult. But I want to lay out the possible consequences of going this way or going that way. Do you understand? Do you need some more information? Now choose. That's the kind of approach that I'm trying to take with them. Sharing my opinion, laying out for them the pros and cons that I see from different options. But in the end, they say, it's your life. You make your own choices. You decide. Why do I do that? Well, first of all, it's, it builds trust. If they see that I give them choices and I let them choose one way or the other, and they eventually realize that daddy was right, he really foresaw already that this good could happen or this bad could happen, and then it actually happened, that builds trust. And then they are far more likely to come back to me asking for my opinion. Second reason, it helps them to grow to be independent. I want them to be independent 20 years from now. In Anna's case, much sooner than that. She's nine. So I want them to be independent. I want them to come to a point where they say, Mommy, Daddy, thanks for raising me. I still want to be your friend. I still love you, and I still want to have a close relationship with you. But I can live by myself now. I don't need you anymore to survive. I want them to get to that point. Third reason why I do this, this approach is something I can do for life. Forcing them works for a time. But building relationship, sharing opinions, and letting them choose what they want and what they think is best is something that is not limited until they are 20. It's not limited to something until when they are 30. And my goal is that when they are adults, that they will still have that kind of relationship with me. And they know they can make their own choices, they know they can live their own lives, but they still choose to dial in with me, or with us, call us and ask us, Mommy, Daddy, what do you think? I have this option, I have this possibility. Do you think I should take this? Or do you think I should take that? I would like to hear your opinion. That's my goal. That's part of the vision that I have for my relationship with them once they are adults. And I'm working towards that now by training with them. You make your own choices. I'm not running your life. You make your own choices. With limits, you're not even an adult, you're not completely independent. But as much as I can, I'm here for you, I'm sharing my opinion, but you choose for yourself. Two more principles. First one, be patient. Proverbs 22.6 is a very famous one. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, what many people don't see is this verse talks about two stages. It talks about being a child, and when they are a child, we should train them. And then the result is when they are Old. What most people don't see is there could be decades in between being a child, being old. But there is a whole adulthood that is not talked about in this verse. This, this verse is not promising that a child will never turn the wrong way, will never make a bad decision, will never have a season when you doubt God or maybe turn away from God. This verse is not giving us that promise. This verse is only giving us the promise that eventually if we train them as a child, they will return to the right way one day. The reason why I'm saying this is we've got to be patient. 
our kids when they are 20, we might have done all the right things, but every child goes through a rebellious stage. Some more, some less, but every child has that phase when they just question everything. And some kids then, I don't want to say they turn away from God, but they really question their faith. They really question, am I a Christian just because I grew up in a Christian family? Or am I a Christian because I want to be a Christian? And every child has a phase when maybe they do things that we never thought they would do because they grew up so well and then they were 15, then they were 20, they were such lovely kids and we thought we've done it. And then suddenly at age 25, they have a season when things, when they go somewhere else and do the things we thought we, they would never do. The Bible never promises us that our children do not go through that phase. The Bible only promises us that when we do a parenting right, they will eventually return to the right path. Be patient. Stay connected with your kids throughout their rebellion. Along the same lines, never stop. Dear parents for life, parenting doesn't stop when the kids leave the house. Parenting stops when we die or when our children die, hopefully we die before them. Kids will take, make terrible choices at times, sometimes not with not so serious consequences, sometimes with very serious consequences. But sometimes we just have to shake our heads and just have to say, kid, what did I teach you? Why do you do this? We all go through that. Sometimes it can feel like they're completely turning the other way. When they are older, you might feel like, I've invested so much in you, and now you don't need me any longer, you don't contact me any longer. Why on earth did I invest 20 years of my life in this, and this is the result? Sometimes parenting can be very frustrating. Parenting involves a lot of strong emotions, good and bad. And my point being, never stop being a parent. Never think like, okay, now they're old, now they're independent. Now I've done it. Now I can stop being a parent. Never stop acting like a parent. Of course, we have to adjust it. Once they are adults, we cannot treat an adult the same way as a five-year-old. But we are still there, and we are still their parents. Never stop praying like a parent. Never think like, okay, now they are responsible for themselves. I don't need to pray for them any longer. They need our prayers. Never stop relating to them as a parent, even when they are adults, even when they have their own family. There is still a special bond between parents and children that, can, that will never go away. Never stop, never give up. Until the day we meet Jesus, we are parents of our children, and we can never relinquish that responsibility. So in conclusion, investing in the next generation was one of the most important things we could ever do. The Bible talks about it over and over again, how important it is to raise a godly next generation. But remember the biblical priorities in all of this. Our own relationship with God is the most important part. We don't, if we're not good with God, how can we parent our children? It's simply not possible. That's the first priority. Nothing should ever come between us and God. Second priority is our marriage. Even when the kids are really needy, when they really stress us out, when we, it feels like we have nothing left at the end of the day, the second priority is our marriage. It's our spouse and we need to act accordingly. Then come our children and parenting. Then comes work. And I want to be careful here, not to get rich, but to provide for the necessities. We can always go overboard with work. And yes, we have to be responsible. We have to make sure we don't lose job and all these things. So we have to work well. But if we go overboard with work, so that we have no time and energy left for our family relationships, then we got our priorities wrong. 
So it's a tool to provide for the necessities for our family, not to get rich, to have five cars, to have a big house and these kind of things. Then we are at work with the wrong priorities, with the wrong motives. But work is the next priority after God and after our family. And then comes everything else. And that includes church, that includes ministry, important as it is as the body of Christ, to love one another, to be there for one another, to help one another, all these things. But it may never interfere with our priority. And that is God first, then our family, and then work as a means to provide for our family. Keep your priorities in order, because once we get those wrong, then everything else will fall apart as well. Don't let any of these other things, including ministry, ever come between you and God or between you and your family. They are more important. Eternity is at stake for the people we are most responsible for, for the people we love the most. Let's make sure we get our priorities right. We love God. We love our spouse. We love our children. We provide for them. And then, if we still have time left, we can do all these other things. May we pray. Father, thank you for the gift of family. Thank you, Lord, for those who are here today who are parents. Thank you, Lord, for the, for the gift of children that you have given us. And Lord, I pray for those of us who are parents that you will help us, Lord, to truly bring glory to you with the way we raise our children. Lord, it's so easy to be caught up in this world, to be caught up in the things. We spend most of our time and energy on things that are less important. But Lord, I pray that you will help us to say no. Teach us to say no to the things that you don't want us to take on. Teach us, Lord, to lay aside our own desires, our own wishes, what I want, if they distract us from you or if they distract us from our family. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you. Help us, Lord, to walk with you. And help us, Lord, to truly be the kind of parents that you want us to be for our children. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to build strong relationships and to truly, Lord, invest in them as a priority, Lord, as you lay it out in your word. Lord, I pray for all of us, whether we are parents right now or not, I pray, Lord, that you will help us to be healed. When we hear these things, we often think of our own parents. We often think of the things that went wrong in our own lives. We often think of the things that didn't go well. Sometimes we respond in anger. Sometimes we respond in frustration. Sometimes we respond in separation. Sometimes we say, I don't want to have anything to do with that any longer. We try to ignore the problems. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that today you will help us to no longer run, but to face these things. Help us, Lord, to walk with you, to surrender these things to you, and to simply allow you, Lord, to heal us. We pray, Lord, for a restoration of relationships with our parents. I pray, Lord, that you will take away anger, you will take away frustration, you will take away bitterness. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to experience a true love relationship with you as our Heavenly Father. And Lord, out of that, the overflow of that experience will allow us to love our parents, to forgive our parents, to let go of that bitterness, and to simply accept the things that have happened and to move on. 
So I want to pray that today will be a day where you will set us free, where you will liberate us. And today will be a day, O oh Lord, when we will experience the power of the blood of Jesus to set us free from our past. Lord, I thank you for, for today. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are with us. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you long to draw us closer to you. So I pray, Lord, that in whatever way you have been speaking to us today, that you will help us, Lord, to respond, not to forget it tomorrow, but to put into action what we have been speaking to us today. Pray to Father, and you love me. In Jesus' name. Amen. As usual, take a few moments. <clears throat>